I'm looking forward to actually getting an American on because at the minute I'm only getting the Canadian side of the story. So I've been mm-hmm. so a little bit biased to all the things yeah. in about the Olympics. <laughs> That's okay, you got to be on our side. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, at the minute, I definitely do. Yeah. <laughs> I've got no choice right now. I've got no other side of the story to go on. Right. <laughs> So you seem like the, the busiest person in all of ice hockey if I go off your Instagram and your social media feeds and things. <laughs> well, I mean, I do try to keep myself busy. Um, and I mean, social media is so fun. So, and it's something that's so simple for us to just connect with people and connect with fans who, you know, look up to us and watch us play hockey. But outside of the rink, it's kind of fun getting to show who I am as a person. So, I mean, that's what I use social media for. And that's kind of how you, you, you develop that connection. That's how you build the new fans, isn't it? Like they become a fan of you as a person because they like you. And then, and then they end up watching you play hockey. And that's how they become a fan of you playing ice hockey. Absolutely. I mean, like I have so many interests outside of the rank. Like I love like makeup and cosmetics and clothes. And so there have been so many people that have like found me because they've seen me post about like makeup or something. And they're like, oh, I like makeup too. What does this girl do? And then they kind of get more into my story. And then, I don't know, it brings people from different walks of life um, into hockey. And then you also go like social media is kind of what you make it because it gets a bad reputation a lot of the time. But I find that if you put out a lot of positive stuff on there, that's what you get back. You kind of, you kind of get what you put into social media and like yours, your social media is definitely all positivity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like obviously social media is such a crazy tool. It can be used for so much good and it can also be used for that negative bad stuff. But I mean, like I'm totally about putting up positive vibes. You know, I'm all about the law of attraction. I believe that if you put out positive things, you're going to get positive things back. And yeah, that's just what I try to do on my social media channels, my outlets, and, and just connect with people. And have you ever experienced any of the, the negative side of it? Obviously, being a woman in professional sports can be a bit of a, a minefield sometimes. Have you ever experienced that side of it? I have. Um, obviously, there are so many people who, you know, comment on things, they tweet at things. Um, that you know are a little ignorant on the on the subject they're uneducated on you know women's professional sports so they just want to kind of put their two cents in and and then they don't think about it ever again so it's kind of it, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt and honestly like things like that don't bother me especially when you get those like faceless people who just want to comment on things like that doesn't bother me in the slightest because I'm like if you can't put your name and your face to a, to a comment that you're going to write me like you don't deserve any of my energy, any of my time. And so I've definitely seen the negative side of it, but there's, there's a lot more positive. I'd say that's what the, the mute and the block buttons were bred for. They are the perfect tools. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like there are easy tickets to get yourself blocked on social media. <laughs> <laughs> so you will be talking about ice hockey then. When, when did ice hockey come into the life of Sarah Nurse? Because they, they, I'm guessing sport has always been involved in your life based on your family tree. Mm -hmm. Yes. So my aunts and uncles, there are eight of them on my dad's side and they all played sports growing up. So they did like volleyball, basketball. Um, One of my uncles played hockey. They did lacrosse, football, like everything. So being active and being in sports was something that pretty much I was born with and (laughs) something that definitely was, was a driving force in my life. But my dad um, actually believed that every Canadian kid should know how to skate and swim. So, I mean, swimming kind of came easy. I did that one. I knocked that one out when I was two or three. And then, um, obviously, the winters would come, ponds would freeze over. And he brought me out there on, like, my little double-bladed skates. And, and he let me go and, and skate. And that's just what I love to do. I love skating. I thought it was, like, the most beautiful thing. It was so much fun. You could go so fast. And from skating, it kind of just naturally led to hockey. and I kind of took off from there. And I, I mean, I played a bunch of sports growing up, but at the end of the day, hockey was one that I always came back to. And it was probably the one that I was the best at and saw most opportunity for myself. So hockey for me started at five years old and kind of took off from there. And so over here, we don't get those winters where the lakes and the rivers freeze over. Just Mm -hmm. tell us about what that experience is like. Because I imagine it is the most beautiful, most serene place to just go on a lake and just skate in the outdoors, in the open. Yeah, it's so cool. It's something that I think that we take for granted. And even where I'm I'm at in Canada, I'm in Ontario, Southern Ontario. And so it doesn't always get that cold here. So not every winter we actually have that. But there are so many places throughout Canada that, you know, it, it gets cold pretty early and it gets cold pretty fast. And just being able to skate outside, like being one with nature while it's snowing, um, it's beautiful and it's amazing. And it's something that 
as you know professional hockey players that when you get to go back to it's it brings you back to those like old day roots when you were just a little kid playing on the outdoor rink and so it's definitely like nostalgic and something that I'd recommend if you get the chance. <laughs> I say, when you're growing up and you're trying all these different sports and obviously I've got to mention one of your uncles in Donovan McNabb who I'm sure everyone in on the planet has heard of what's it like growing up with someone like him in your family it's really cool I mean it's funny because from a young age I was just surrounded by so much excellence um I remember going to see my aunt rocks play at Syracuse University she played NCAA basketball that's where she met my uncle Donovan um but I mean I saw that when I was two and three years old so I'd just been surrounded by that passion and that drive and that hunger and then being able to watch my Uncle Donovan, um, getting to go spend weeks with them and, and just see the way he trains and see the way he treats his body and, and how he navigates life as a professional athlete was something that's pretty cool. And it's something that has inspired, I think, me, my cousins, my brother, um, as we've gone up through our own uh, professional careers. And especially watching him deal with it in a city like Philadelphia, which is intense Hostile. with their sports teams. <laughs> To say the least. Yes. Uh, it, it was kind of funny. Like they, in Philly, like they either love you or they hate you one week and then the next week they love you again. So yeah, going to Philly and getting to spend time with them and seeing how the sports world like loved him there. Um, you know, I still go to Philly and I see his jersey, like people wearing his jersey. And I'm like, man, he hasn't played in the league in how many years? Um, but it's pretty cool. They're so passionate about sports. I mean, I remember having to go places like with security because he was such a big deal that we couldn't go out without security because he'd get like swarmed with fans and stuff. So yeah, I mean, Philly is a, it's a spot for sure. <laughs> and then obviously you've got Darnell, who's your other cousin, who is one of your cousins and he's playing in the NHL at the moment. Did you grow up with him? Did, were you playing on the ice together or did you grow up in different areas of Canada? No, we actually grew up probably five minutes from each other. Um, and so growing up, like we were together so, so much. And we didn't play a ton of hockey together just because I think our paths were different. Like he, from a young age, took hockey a lot more seriously than I did. Um, just because he, there were opportunities for, for boys that there weren't really for girls. So he played in the city that we grew up in and then actually moved to another city to play. Um, as we grew up but I mean like some of my fondest memories are with him and, and our other cousin Kia just hanging at grandma's house playing basketball and and doing different things around the house so we definitely grew up very connected. And uh, You mentioned Kia, uh, a WNBA player, that is a league and we're going to get into this a little bit more a little bit later, that is a league that is growing based mm -hmm. on its relationship with the main sports team, with the main organization the NBA. Is that, a, is that something you look at with hope and potential for how women's hockey is going to go absolutely i think you look at the WNBA and, and where they've come from and where they are now um and there's really exponential growth i mean the league started i think it's like 20 25 years ago and so it's really still in its infancy but how they've learned from their mistakes and grown from it as a league and you know obviously had that affiliation with the with the nba has helped them i think tremendously i think you look at where they are now um with you know the nba players going to their games and supporting them and and being out there in the media supporting them and i think it's huge but that's something that you know didn't happen overnight that, that was a process and i think it just shows that you know game respects game and and there's a huge respect for what how women's professional athletes uh work and and what they do as well as this, when, when you go, when you watch, say, a Washington Mystics game, when you see Bradley Beal in an Elena Deladon shirt, that matters. Yeah. Oh, that's huge. Like, that just shows how much respect there is um, as athletes. And, and I love to see it. I mean, I've been in contact with a bunch of guys in the NHL, and, and they just, they know how much effort we put in. They know how much sacrifice, and it's, it's just as much as they. And so they, they respect that, and, and they want more for us. But I'm going to get into the PWHPA a little bit later on. That's just like a little teaser of where I'm going to go with that. So I got ahead of myself when you mentioned Kia Nurse. So, um, so when you, you, you mentioned earlier about opportunities for girls in Canada playing hockey isn't overly um, fruitful sort of thing. When was your first, do you remember the first team you got into? Was it like a, a boys team sort of thing? Then? Yeah. So I started off playing boys hockey um, just in like a, little house league recreational league um in the city and so that was completely a boys league i think i there may have been one other girl in it 
And I kept playing boys hockey until I was about 11 or 12 years old. And then from there, I actually went to a girls organization. And things honestly have have changed a lot since I was a child. Um, I look back 25 years ago when I started playing hockey and girls organizations were not what they are today. Today, there are so many minor hockey organizations for girls, um, especially across Ontario, which is where I'm from. We have a huge, huge um, girls organization and also across Canada. Like you can play girls hockey from when you were three years old up until, you know, you're a professional hockey player. And so things have drastically changed. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how I grew up. <laughs> now you spent four years in the, from what I've read, my research on elite prospects on Wikipedia, which is what you have to do these days. <laughs> yes. You spent four years in the PWHL. What was yep. your experience like in that league? That was amazing. I mean, that is the like top premier league for high school girls, basically. Um, it's not our high school hockey. Uh, it's separate from that. It's more of a, a club rep level. But it was awesome. I mean, I got to play against the best teams in North America, not only um, in Ontario and Canada, from the United States as well. Uh, we got to go to a ton of tournaments across North America. We had our own league play, which was, which was huge because not everybody gets that. But it was also great for different opportunities. I was scouted to play Team Ontario. I was scouted to play Team Canada and then also to go to the University of Wisconsin. And so it sets you up for success and it sets you up, you know, for that college route, that, that university route. And if you're fortunate enough to go to the national team uh, route. And then that, those four years set you up to go and play for the under 18s in Canada, as you said, what was that? What do you remember getting, was, is it a phone call you get for that? Do you have to go through like trials to get in? How does that process work from PWHL to under 18s mm -hmm. Canada? Yeah. So pretty much uh, hockey Canada has scouts that come and watch games all the time. They have tournaments They're They're kind of everywhere. So they basically scout you. And I think they bring in about, I want to say 40 or 50 girls and they have basically tryout camps. So you have an off ice strength conditioning camp and then you go to the on ice strength or on ice uh, camp basically. And from there they will pick the team. And so uh, I remember my first year I got cut from the team. I, I didn't make it when I was 16. And then when I was 17, I went back and I actually got hurt. So I wasn't able to make the team in the summer. And I got reselected for the team that went to the world championships um, in the winter time. So that experience was awesome. I mean, I got to play at my first world championship. So it was the first time that I was playing against Team USA, who was obviously like our hugest rivals. And we ended up winning gold, which was amazing. It was like a very dramatic fashion. Like we were down, I think, two to one with like 10 seconds to go. We ended up scoring to tie it up and then winning it in overtime. So it was pretty thrilling. And it was awesome. Like that was my first taste of a gold medal with Team Canada. That's almost like the, the exact same situation when Team Canada won their last gold medal at the Olympics. Yeah, it's <laughs> right, exactly. Like, very similar. <laughs> That's actually spookily similar. Yeah. <laughs> and do, do you remember when, when you, that first time when you didn't get in, how much more did that motivate you for the next time you went there? It was huge. Um, I think at the beginning when I, when I was cut, <clears throat> it was a little demoralizing because you think that that is like your entire life and you don't know if you're ever going to get back to that. And so I know that's a little dramatic, but it was definitely tough at first because that was the first time that it ever really happened to me. And I didn't, I was like, I'm so good at hockey. Like, how could this happen to me? But it, it really made me examine uh, myself and what I was doing and, and what I needed to do to get to the next level. And so honestly, I think that was one of like the biggest growth points in my career because it, it made me realize that you know I wasn't perfect I had things to work on and that I could be better so when, when you win that gold medal talk to me about the feeling when you when that overtime goal goes in you realize that you've got this goal you've been through all you've been through the on ice camp the off ice camp it all culminates in that gold medal, your first gold medal for Canada what's that feeling it like still gives me chills like even thinking about it like I feel like I just had this rush over my body but <laughs> um it's it's just such like an indescribable feeling like winning anything like I'm sure you won something in your life everybody listening to this has won something in their life like there's just that special feeling that you're just so proud of and you just think about what has gone into this gold medal you know it's not just a, a little piece of metal hanging around my neck like there is so much that that went into that so it's just like an indescribable very very special feeling and something that 
it's a feeling that I get when other people win championships. So when I'm watching things on TV, like I'm watching the Stanley cup finals um, and that they end up winning whatever team ends up winning the Stanley cup. Like I feel that. And I'm like, I know, like to, I know how amazing of a feeling that is. <laughs> so you go from there into the NCAA. Mm-hmm. What led to you choosing Wisconsin? So I assume you had, you went and visited different campuses, different places. What was it that, about Wisconsin that made you say, yes, this is where, I want to be for the next four years. Right. I visited a ton of places um, in the United States to go to school, but ultimately like it came down to my pros and cons list. And I had things that I wanted out of the university and Wisconsin ended up taking those boxes. You know, I wanted a big university. I wanted to go to school and sit in a lecture with like 400 people. Like I wanted to be a number. Um, I didn't even want the professor to know my name. I wanted good athletics. I wanted a good hockey team and I ultimately just wanted a place that, you know, I could have a good time. I could have fun. I could make friends. I could play hockey and I could get a good education. So at the end of the day, like Wisconsin just checked all those boxes for me. And and it helped certainly that they were one of the top teams in the NCAA. Um, As a women's hockey player, you're treated like an absolute rock star there. We have our own everything. I remember my junior year, like they just came in one day after practice and gave us iPads. (laughs) because that's what they were giving to the entire athletic department. So everybody got iPads and um, I'll, honestly, like Wisconsin, I'm biased, but best university on earth. <laughs> uh, are there any games from your time at Wisconsin in the NCAA that stick out in your mind when you think back about it? Is there anything that comes straight to the forefront? Yeah, definitely. Oh God, there are a lot, but definitely the first one that probably came to my mind was um, it was my senior year and we were playing min- the Minnesota Golden Gophers, who are like our rivals. Um, it's like a Canada USA rivalry, but in a college level. And we play two game series. So we'll play Friday, Saturday. And the first game they came out and they beat us to nothing. And it, we didn't have a great game. So we knew we had to rebound back really quickly. And that game, we ended up beating them eight to two. And I ended up getting a hat trick actually. And (laughs) it was just like an absolutely insane game because we just kept scoring. And it was like, not that we weren't used to scoring and we weren't used to beating people, but we just kept scoring on Minnesota. And that was a really big deal because they're our biggest rivals. And when you get to rivalry games in college sports, they they are intense games, aren't they? Because like North Americans, they take, college sports is very different to anything over here. Is, college is, sports in not in Canada, <laughs> college sports in the United States is a completely different animal. Like you have obviously like you guys have your sports teams over there, but in the States, they take college sports more seriously than they take professional sports. And it's like you kids are born and they die Badger fans. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. <laughs> We've had players on our team who have spoken to them about their college experiences and they will not hear anything good about another school that they didn't go to. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> and then that NCAA experience leads you to get in. It, 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 that leads to your full Team Canada debut at the Olympics eventually. Mm-hmm. But you, you, you spent some time in something called the AEHL, the Alberta Elite Hockey League. Was that like a, a preparation for the Olympics from based on what I can work out? Yeah, so basically like a a little overview of what happens um, for us to make the Olympic team is basically they pick 28 players in about March, I guess. So the last Olympics was 2018. So in March 2017, they picked 28 of us. And what we had to do is we had to move um, from wherever we were living to a place called Calgary, Alberta in Canada. So that's kind of out west for me. And we live there and we train as a team for the six, eight months leading up to the Olympics. So that Alberta Hockey League is actually one that us as Team Canada, we entered. So we entered into a boys league. It's like a midget AAA boys league. So these boys are like 17, 18 years old, I believe. And we enter in their league for a year. And we actually play like as we were a normal team in their league. And so we play against them. And we played like 50 games that year against those boys teams. Um, just to get us ready for the Olympics, because obviously, like, we're, we're Team Canada. There's aren't really many girls teams that we <laughs> can play um, against other than the United States, really. And so we play them also a few times leading up to the Olympics. But, no, it's, it's a tough year for sure because they pick 28 players, but they have to get it down to 23. So they end up cutting people um, throughout the year along the way before they make their final roster. And then when you make that final roster, 
Where, where is that a phone call? Are you all in a room together and they say who's in the team? How does that part work? <laughs> oh gosh, that would be savage if we were all sitting there. <laughs> Um, great no, TV so, though. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like the most dramatic. <laughs> so basically it's like a very, how we do it in Canada. It's a very meticulous process and they basically have like a door that you enter and some escorts for another. So you don't have any contact with any of your other teammates. And so what happens was after kind of our season's over, I think it was like December 21st or 22nd, but they actually did it in like seniority. So our vets went first and they guided you know, one player at a time in and they basically said, hey, you're coming to the Olympics or hey, unfortunately, you didn't make it. And so I was one of the last people to go. And I think I was like third last, like the suspense was already high because I was waiting all morning. And so I kind of got escorted in and I waited in the little waiting lounge area. And then the coaches brought me in and I don't even know if I sat down, like, I don't even know how it happened. But my head coach just like stood up and was like, congratulations, do you want to go to the Olympics? And I was like, do I want to go to the Olympics? <laughs> of course I want to go to the Olympics. And I don't remember anything else from that conversation at all. Uh, I just remember sitting there being like, I'm going to the Olympics. <laughs> I, I imagine that the things you would learn as well, playing in that EA, AEHL, when you've got teammates like Shannon Zabados, you've got marie Philip Poulin on that team. These are like legends in Canada. When, when you're on the ice with them, can you quite believe that you're there at that point? No. Like sometimes <laughs> when I'm on the ice with who is Abby now, I kind of look over and I'm like, geez, <laughs> how did I get here with you? But I just look at some of the players in our program um, and who've, who've played on our team. Uh, Cassie Campbell, she, she works with our organization now. And it's like, I can't believe that, that I talk to you on a regular basis. Like, I can't believe we're friends. I can't believe that we share the ice together because it's honestly like, it's an honor. Like you, you watch these players growing up. Like I, I remember watching Pooh in the 20, 2010 Olympics and I remember seeing the impact that she had on that team. And now it's like, we're friends. Like <laughs> I talk to her and I get to practice and play with her. And, and it's just a really cool thing because we have that tradition of excellence. There's, there's to a much lesser extent, but um, not this season, the season before Chris Stewart came to play for us for four months. Okay. And I remember walking down the corridor and he went, Oh, hi Dan. I was like, and as he got out of earshot, I was like, oh, my God, Chris Stewart knows who I am. Because I spent, I spent all my life watching him on TV. I'm like, oh, my God, that guy knows my name. This is crazy. Right. It kind of, like, blows your mind. But it also brings you back, like, those people are just people, too. Yeah. Like. That's like, he's the nicest guy. So I remember the first yeah. day he was there. Because, like, when he came in, like, all the press came to Nottingham. Like, we had all the new – that normally ignore us. They all came in. Yeah. And, like, we were telling him what to do. And he's like, oh, do you want to do this? Do you want to do this next? I was like, do you want to do this now? Or do you want to do this later? And he goes, you tell me, I just work here. And yeah. that's that, there's like, I mean, he, like, he's this big star, but he's just like everybody else. And right. I think it's the same for you with those girls when you get to know them. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then, you, then what goes into the prep, once you've made that squad, what then goes into the preparation before you get to Pyeongchang? Mm -hmm. So we continued playing. Um, I think we probably had like 10 or 15 games before we actually left for Pyeongchang. And then our kind of, uh, I guess, transit there, we went over two weeks before the Olympics started. So we went over and stayed in a place called Incheon. And we stayed there. We found actually some men's university teams to play against. So we ended up playing against those guys. And then we actually got to the, go to the Olympic Village um, at the end of our two weeks and kind of started our Olympic journey. And what, what, what was the Olympic Village like? Tell me through that. It was so cool. Like it's just such a cool place to be surrounded by so many people who have achieved so much. And, you know, we all had one thing that united us and that was sport. And it didn't matter, you know, what country you came from, if you were a male or a female, how, how old you were, there are just so many people who have excelled in whatever sport they wanted to do. And it was awesome to be surrounded by people who are so hardworking and are so dedicated. And it, it's an awesome experience, like going to the dining hall, there are so many different activations that they have, like they have stores, they have obviously where you, where you live. And, and so it was just like a world in, inside the world, basically. <laughs> so you, you're in this experience for the first time. And then the crazy thing about it is that women's professional sports is always fighting for attention. You're always fighting for that. But when you get to that Olympic Games, suddenly that spotlight burns bright and the, the press say you cannot lose these games against the USA and these people. How do you deal with that kind of thing mentally where it's just like, where you just have to switch on and then the world, then 
the the world and the entirety of Canada is got that weight is on your guys' shoulders. Yeah, I think honestly, like it's it's definitely pressure for sure. Like you go into the Olympics, you know, you know more often than not, you're going to be playing the United States. Obviously there's no guarantee of you playing in the gold medal game, but um, we worked hard. So we were confident that we were going to be able to get there. And as you kind of go into those games, you know what it's like. And I don't want to say there's no pressure, but when you're confident in your preparation and, and what you've been doing, like I remember going into the gold medal game and I wasn't nervous because I was confident in what I prepared with I was confident in what I was bringing to the game and my talents and abilities and so I think from a media standpoint like they obviously kind of build the Canada USA uh, rivalry up so much (laughs) because it's a great story but you know when we play the the Americans like it's our rivalry we want to beat them and it, it it's it's just, we want to win the game. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're American, if you're Finnish, if you're Swedish, like we we just want to beat you. (laughs) So it's pretty cool though. It's, it's cool that at the Olympics, the men and women are obviously equal. And especially last Olympics when the NHL players actually didn't attend for hockey, like all eyes were on us, which was, it was pretty cool. Obviously that you went through to the final in that and lost in a shootout, which is not the best way to, and an Olympic gold medal game, I'm sure any player would agree. But is there, is there a moment, is it like the, the opening ceremony where it hits you like, oh, I'm here now? Yeah, I mean, opening ceremonies was insane. Like you walk into this stadium that's absolutely massive. There's music, there's lights, and you're walking in with so many athletes, like especially being from Canada, like we're not the biggest country ever, but we're not small. So mm-hmm. we're walking in with hundreds of other athletes who are so proud to be Canadian and we're just a part of this greater team and you know when they announce Canada like it's like goosebumps because it's so cool and you know opening ceremonies was unreal um playing my first Olympic game was so awesome having my family there to support me um yeah the whole experience was amazing scoring your first Olympic goal as well yeah that was pretty cool too (laughs) (laughs) yeah that was that was like so crazy like I couldn't have I didn't go into the Olympics like expecting I want to score this goal I want to score that goal like no I just went to the Olympics like wanting to have an impact and like wanting to win a gold medal so when I scored I was like oh <laughs> how that happened <laughs> so have you, have you got a, a favorite story from that Olympic Games from from being with the team sort of thing mm-hmm. yeah I mean kind of my like aha moment I think when it was like the warm-ups to our first game and I looked at one of my teammates Blair Turnbull and we both kind of like stood there during warm-ups and we're looking around the rink as we're on the ice and just being like as if we're at the Olympics right now so that was kind of an aha moment but we had so much fun off the ice I mean after we were done competing I remember after the men's um, final the men's hockey final they got a bronze medal and a whole bunch of us went, like, not just hockey players, like, a whole bunch of people from a whole bunch of other sports, and we ended up, like, finding our way onto this bus, and obviously, like, we couldn't communicate with the bus driver, and so the bus was taking us somewhere we didn't know where, where. we were singing, like, Celine Dion on the bus, we were, and then they dropped us off somewhere, and we were just walking through the streets of Korea back to the Olympic Village, we went to, like, a karaoke place, and yeah, we just had a lot of fun. <laughs> They're almost the memories you that stick with you more than the game sometimes, aren't they? It's that, that camaraderie off the ice. Exactly, yeah, because it's like, obviously you have fun on the ice, but on the ice is like, it's like business. Like, it's like if you're going into a boardroom, like on the ice is, is where you got to be serious, is where, you, is where it's business. And off the ice, that's where we get to have our fun. <laughs> and so, like I said before, losing in a shootout in an Olympic Games sucks. There's no other way to put that. But what's going through your mind on the bench when it gets to that situation? Is it, oh, I wish we could keep going in overtime, or is it? Yeah, it definitely was, I wish we could keep going to overtime because, you know, we had played 80 minutes of hockey at this point. Like, somebody was bound to score um, sooner rather than later. So it was kind of disappointing because it was anticlimactic. And then as we're going into the shootout, I knew that I wasn't going to be one of the ones who was in the shootout. So I was like, all right, like it's out of my hands. I can't do anything about it. But our team had struggled a little bit with shootouts um, that year. We played an exhibition game against Switzerland, I believe it was. And we beat them 10 nothing, And then we lost 5 nothing in the shootout. Oh, wow. So, yeah. yeah. So it's like, like that's how much better we were um, than they were. But then when it came to a shootout, like, 
clean sweep. They beat us. <laughs> and so as we went into the shootout, I was like, okay, like maybe this is our day. Like we're, we're going to do this. And I remember Spooner, uh, Natalie Spooner, she was like the one person that would like consistently always score on the shootouts um, that we had. And I remember when I saw the puck skip off her stick and she didn't score, I was like, <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> I don't know if this is our day. <laughs> And so I remember just being on the bench and I was like hyping people up. I was like, you know, Gus, like Megan Augusta, like you got this girl, like you're going in and this is your goal kind of thing. And I just remember like being so positive and our whole team was so positive. And so um, when their goalie ended up saving that last shot, it was just like crushing, just devastating. And you spoke about before how that, that kind of crushing feeling when you, didn't, when you got cut in 2016, you didn't make the Olympic team, mm-hmm. the, the, the team Canada. Is, yeah. Is, is that now a motivating factor for the next Olympics? Yeah, because it's difficult because obviously, you know, the Canada-USA rivalry goes back so far and we were going for our fifth straight gold medal, which would have been like an Olympic record. And so it's definitely tough being with all of those players who know what it's like to win gold at the Olympics, um, which is a, a bunch of our team. And so we, going into the next one, like, we push even harder every single day because we want to be back on top. And like the thought of coming out of another Olympics without a gold medal is very, very daunting. (laughs) Then then it's kind of a whirlwind for you. You come back from that Olympics and you get drafted in the CWHL Mm -hmm. to the Toronto Furies. What's that experience like? Because you got drafted in 2016 to the Boston Pride in the NWHL. So can you just break down what the difference between the leagues is kind of thing over there at that point. Yeah. So it's a little bit confusing, but basically the CWHL had been like a nonprofit. It wasn't a professional league at the very beginning um, when they started, but they basically had a league, but it was predominantly in Canada and they had one location in Boston. So there was that league. And so somebody else came along and decided to start another league called the NWHL. um, I think in 2014 or 2015 and expanded to American cities so it was kind of I guess divided geographically like the CWHL is mostly in Canada and WHL is mostly in the United States and so the way that the NWHL worked like we didn't even know really what they were they were just like drafting people and so I remember getting like a Twitter notification being like Sarah Nurse selected in the I don't even know what it was like second round or something like that to the Boston team and I was like, oh, <laughs> like, <what is> this? <laughs> and so I didn't really know much about it at all. Um, but and then I guess when I was going into the CWHL draft, I obviously knew more about that league because I knew the girls who played in it. And so they had been talking to me about it. And obviously being from Toronto, um, we have the Toronto Maple Leafs. And so being drafted to kind of like the female counterpart, the, the Toronto Furies was um, awesome. It was such a great experience and being able to play in like my hometown team (laughs) do you find out beforehand when they're going to draft you or is it a surprise when it does happen so how it works because obviously we're not compensated um they can't really tell us to move like they kind of can to the men in the nhl basically what happens is you have to pick a geographical region so my region was the gta toronto area and so there are two teams in this area so i could go to either of those teams Um, But I had been in contact with the Furies because they had the first pick before the other team. So they had kind of let me know that I was going to be that pick. But, hey, you never know on draft day. So you get drafted onto the Furies. You get to play with your Team Canada teammate, Natalie Spooner, who Mm -hmm. she's been on here. She's a character. Is she that full of life all the time? (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Yeah, she has, like, so much energy. Like, is always singing, always wants to do something. Like She's like the Energizer, Energizer Bunny. Um, she's so much fun though she's somebody who definitely doesn't take life too seriously and uh, you need people like that on the team and then tell me about that that season you spent in the CWHL what was that like yeah it was definitely very different Um, professional hockey is definitely not like NCAA hockey it's different from Team Canada Um, you know professional hockey is is great and it's something that I'm looking forward to continuing doing and it's something that Obviously, we want to build a league to, to be able to do that. But I had so much fun my first year. 
Uh, we weren't on a great team. You know, our team kind of had a lot of struggles at the beginning of the season. I don't know how many games we won in the first half of the season. Um, it kind of looked like we were out of playoff spots, playoff contention. It kind of looked like we were going to just be done pretty early. But in the second half of the season, like we really turned it around, came together, and it got down to our last regular season game where we like snuck into the playoffs and we needed like one point I think and we we got that point we ended up in the playoffs and we had so much fun it was a great year and then after that year the CWHL disbands or goes defunct or something like that what happened with that and then out of that breeds the PW Professional Women's Hockey Players Association. There's so many initials in all these different things. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, that, that is born out of, that's kind of comes from that. And there's a lot of you guys involved. What, just talk to me about the, where were you when the CWHL went down? And when, and when did you start to get, the, when did the feelers and the, the PWHPA start to become a thing? Mm-hmm. I guess we actually found out about it while we were in Finland last year um, at the World Championships. And so all of the national team players were in Finland um, and then the non-national team players, the girls who didn't make team, you know, Canada, USA, Finland, um, whatever, were back in Canada. And we actually found out through a phone call, our commissioner and our board of directors were on this phone call. And we thought we were getting good news. Like they had reached out and they were like, we want to chat with everybody, blah, blah, blah. We thought we were actually expanding. And when they called and told us that, we were all just very confused. There weren't a ton of answers. There still aren't a ton of answers um, about why this whole thing happened. Um, But ultimately, it wasn't financially sustainable. So, um, yeah, we kind of just had to take that and put that on the back burner because we were playing at the World Championships. Uh, We had games. And so after the World Championships... Bit of a distraction. (laughs) Bit of a distraction, learning that your future in hockey, you don't know where it's going to (laughs) be. So we had to put that one aside and continue playing. But after we got back from Finland, um, the World Championship had finished. We kind of got to talking and discussing. And there were things that happened in the NWHL to players that were playing in our league now. um, And they didn't really like it. They didn't really recommend it. And we didn't want to take a lateral step from one kind of less than professional environment to another. So we decided to come together and form the PWHPA because we want to really demand better and we believe that we deserve better. And so we are working very diligently um, into creating a long-term and sustainable professional women's hockey league that is going to be around for generations to come because that's, that's the biggest thing. I mean, you have the CWHL, there was a league before that, and they all came up and ended up folding, you know, 10 to 15 years after they, um, originated and so we want something that's going to be around for hundreds of years something that little girls can dream of, of playing in and so that's really our mission with PWHPA um, and what we're doing now. And that hard work got you a pretty big invite to the NHL All-Star Weekend in St. Louis. Mm-hmm, yeah, what was that, that experience like? Oh uh, that weekend was incredible um, it was it was pretty awesome because in previous years what the NHL had done is they brought in um, I think four female players every year to kind of like demonstrate the skill drills and just kind of be a part of the weekend and with what had gone on in the CWHL folding and us forming the PWHPA um, I think that they wanted us to have a bigger impact and so they gave us our entire own event at the NHL game. we got to play in our three-on-three game and it was huge because it was the platform that we needed um, to show people what we can do so many people, you know, still talk about the All-Star game and say that the women were the highlight of the entire All-Star weekend because, you know, yeah, the skills are fun. They're cool to watch. It's cool to see the hardest shot and, and everything they do. But the NHL, you know, All-Star game, it's very lackadaisical. You know, they're not trying very hard. And so sometimes it's a little tough to watch because the guys, you know, they don't want to get hurt. They're, they're not going 100%. You know, it's, it's kind of like they're off weekend. <laughs> It's a holiday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's kind of like a, a little vacation. And so, yeah, their game's a little accidental, but ours is like high intense, high pressure because, again, you're at that Canada-USA rivalry and there are bragging rights on the line. But the whole experience was so cool, getting to be treated like true professionals and see how they're treated. I mean, something as simple as like when we go to hotels, we always share hotel rooms. And we showed up at our hotel and we all had our own rooms, which is something that doesn't happen. <laughs> so it was it was neat and one of the things you had to do is there's not a lot of three on three hockey there's not been a lot of three on three in women's hockey you have to go out there and play it for about 20 about 20 30 minutes straight how was that on the lungs 
exhausting. Like, <laughs> I remember, I think they had it split up into like 10 minute halves. I think that's how they did it. But regardless, we had like a, a half time and I was like, guys, I can't do this for another 10 minutes. <laughs> like, I'm winded. We, we've got it. We've got to chill here because three on three is totally different. Like there's a lot of ice out there and it's not something that we're used to. Like we, I think we did five on five overtime at the Olympics, I want to say. Yeah, you were, you were going to do three on three at the World Championships this year if it right. happened. But it was the first time that we would have done mm. three on three. So we've never done anything less than four on four. And so three on three is a whole different game. It's all, let me tell you how much ice there is. Out there. <laughs> and it's exhausting. <laughs> I was like, we could have used a couple of extra players. <laughs> I was watching a, a thing on Sportsnet a few months ago, and Mitch Marner was on there, and he was saying how the men's players weren't allowed to go on the bench, like be in the corridors and the benches and watch and be a distraction. So, the, so they had to watch it on the TVs backstage. And apparently, those TVs, it was like standing room only at those TVs to watch you girls on the ice. Yeah, they after we finished the game, they were like, hats off, props to you, because that was so entertaining. Like, obviously, there's a whole bunch going on at the um, the All Star game, but from their locker rooms like they all had tvs and everything and like from what they told like they were all glued to the tvs like they had cameras in there like they were literally just watching and being like how are these girls doing this right now because i mean we had nine players on each on each team and we did three on three for 20 minutes like that's a long time and i mean we were going pretty balls to the walls like it was 150 percent and so i'm glad they enjoyed it <laughs> but he enjoyed it we needed like a really big cool it down and an ice bath after but <laughs> and then the, the the thing is on the tv as well it got the big it got the big presentation on the tv because you have the i can never remember the commentator's name the guy who's the voice of hockey night in canada the J, something hugh Huseman, houston jim houston the, the oh, co- I, 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 I know what he sounds like in my head. I can never yeah. remember his name. And he's yeah. really bad because I always remember Doc Emmerich, but I can never remember yeah. the Canadian guy, which <laughs> is terrible of me, I know. But to have him on that presentation, so when you, when, a, when a casual viewer turns in, his voice is very recognizable. Right. Then you, your girls as names is huge mm-hmm. for all of you. It is. It's so big because, again, like, we don't get that exposure ever. Like, other than the Olympics or if the world championship is in Canada or the United States, like you don't get that exposure. Um, I remember leaving the NHL all-star game and like something as simple as like social media. I got like 3000 followers or something like that. And I'm just like, NHL players could get this on a daily basis. Like they play 82 games a year. Um, There's so many, there's, there's so much opportunity for people to see them. And that's not something that we get as female athletes in general. Um, I always talk about like being your own brand, like female athletes, we are our own brand because nobody else is going to market us (laughs) but ourselves. And that's, that's really difficult. Like we're trying to sell our own tickets, which like we shouldn't have to do. There should be, you know, marketing departments for that. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. (laughs) <laughs> it's one of the things that we we've never we've done it we've been done a bad job at like promoting like women's sports in the past but this year we we kind of partnered with one of the local soccer teams here and okay. they came down to that they're, they're not professional they're like semi-professional working their way up to get professional and okay. working with them has been incredible like a real eye-opener so like mm-hmm. the, the, the battle they face to yeah. try and get that attention and build it up and building it up and building it up so it's really eye-opening when you get involved in it and you see how it all works which is why yeah. I love having people like you and Natalie and the people we've got lined up to come on this and hear these stories and things. It's, it's, I hope it's as I've been for other people as it has been for me getting to know this kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, for so much of the time, like we're kind of out of sight, out of mind. So it's not that people aren't um, kind of outraged at what's going on or, or it's not that people don't want to help. It's just that they don't know. Like people didn't know that we had to pay for our own skate sharpening like going to and like a little shop like a hockey shop and getting our own skate sharpen like we don't have equipment managers paying for our own tape and things like that like if you don't have an equipment sponsorship which I'm fortunate enough to have but a lot of my teammates don't they have to pay for their own equipment and so it's just little things like that that people don't realize that you think as a professional hockey player you should have and so the, the last thing about that um that all-star weekend I watched yep. it just before we started this. I would put it on just to refresh my memory of it. Yeah. That arena was packed and it was loud and it was very pro USA. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the one unfortunate thing about it. <laughs> that was very, you know what? I hate that chant. So I can't, I can't stress that enough how much I hate hearing USA. 
Oh God. Like I'm usually good with not listening to the crowd, but when I hear that, I'm like, God, I want to shut these people up so bad. <laughs> it's when, yeah. it's every time you went, uh, they went down the other end and then uh, DBM made the big save. It's like, Ooh, right, <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's so loud every time. <laughs> Or it's silent. <laughs> that makes it so much sweeter, though. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so obviously, with the, with everything that's going off in in the world right now, the the pandemic and things, how have you been keeping yourself fit and ready for when you get the go ahead to be able to get get on the ice and stuff again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of like off ice training. So I mean, I don't have a home gym or anything here, so I'm getting creative. I have like we have like five gallon water jugs and I've been using that as weights because I don't have weights. I don't have a rack. I don't have anything like that. So I've been doing a lot of training outside. Um, I've been doing a lot of like stick handling and shooting. Uh, you get like a little plastic surface and you can actually shoot and stick handle pucks, which is pretty convenient. But yeah, I haven't been on the ice since March, which is a very, very long time. <laughs> so I'm nervous for that first time that I'm going to be back on the ice. Nervous, but how much do you miss it? I do. I miss it a lot. Like sometimes I, I forget about it, honestly, because I think this is actually the time of year that I miss it the most because usually the Stanley Cup playoffs are going on and I'm like, oh, I would love to be out there right now. I'd love to be competing. But yeah, I, sometimes you just forget how much you miss it and you step on the ice and you're like, yeah, I feel good. <laughs> and then to, to turn this a little bit serious just for, for, for a moment, I watched an interview you did on Sportsnet last week. Mm -hmm about okay. the racial injustices in in the world yeah. and things like that and yeah. you mentioned the thing about canada being very insular and not realizing it has a problem sort of thing and the uk is a lot like that yeah but we we don't it's not admitted that there's a problem but there is a problem this whole thing has been exacerbated over the world now i just mm -hmm. wonder if you could just talk a little bit about your experience as a as you because i remember you did an instagram post where you said you don't normally speak out because you're mm -hmm. biracial sort of thing mm -hmm. of course yeah i mean looking at kind of where we are at the world in terms of race, um, I think that a lot of people from other countries kind of pass the blame and criticize the United States um, just because of obviously their history is, is very out there and very right in front of you on a plate kind of thing. And although yes, their history is their history, each country kind of has a different hand in, in racism and that definitely needs to be recognized. And so in Canada, with us being so close to the United States, it's, it happens all the time. People say, oh, I'm so happy. I'm so glad. I'm so lucky that I'm from Canada and then we don't have any of that. Well, that's simply not true. Um, and so my stance on that is just that we need to educate ourselves. And in terms of black history, like we in Canada, I don't even think it's taught. I mean, I learned all of my black history from my dad, who's actually a history teacher. And so he, he taught me everything. And obviously it was very important to him that I knew um, my black history. And so obviously when I posted on, in, on Instagram about, you know, my experiences, I don't usually speak out about it because I've never actually known like my place within the conversation. And obviously like I have very light skin. So I have been afforded different privileges that other people who have darker skin than I do um, haven't been afforded. And so I just wanted to share that experience because I knew that a lot of people that followed me from Canada um, kind of separated themselves from the whole violence and police brutality that's so um, apparent in the United States. And I wanted to bring them a small example of something that happens every single day that they could maybe relate to or that they could kind of pick up in their everyday life. So my kind of hope for, for what's to come is that people just educate and people truly truly like if they see something that happens they need to stand up and they need to point out that you know what's happening is wrong and and if somebody makes a comment an inappropriate comment a racial slur anything like that like step up and don't be afraid like have the confidence to say that say that that's wrong and what kind of reaction did you get from that because as you said you don't speak about those things very often when you actually made that post what kind of reaction did you get from that i got all positive feedback i mean as we talked about before, like social media is a pretty powerful tool and it's very powerful when you use it in a very like honest and genuine way. And that was, that was my intent. Like I, I just wanted to post that because I know that I have a platform and that I have a voice and that it could reach a large audience. And I wanted, you know, that experience to reach a large audience because it would make people kind of think. And so I got so much positive feedback about that. Um, obviously, like I speak about a lot of different issues, a lot of different inequalities with, you know, gender. 
And so although it's, it's not the same, there are similarities, there are parallels, and this is also something that I'm passionate about. And it's the thing that, that everyone should be passionate about because like, everyone is equal. So I, I read a book called Sapiens. I don't know if you've ever heard of the book called Sapiens. Mm-hmm. It's about there's no such thing as, a, as an American or a Canadian. It's just there is just homo yeah. sapiens. There are just human beings and that's right. all there is. <laughs> Right. Like we've all come from the same place along the line, you know, like where our ancestors have come from, we've all come from the same place. It's just a matter of where we settled, who we settled with and what we started believing, I think, at at those points. And so there's so many things like I think of like religious, you you know, differences. And I'm just like, you're not different as people. You just believe in different things. And obviously there's there's a recognition of that, but also recognizing that, you know, we're all created equal so we all should have equal opportunities and we should all be treated as equals and my general rule of thumb if you treat if you if you're an asshole i'm going to treat you like an asshole if you're nice i'm going to treat you nice they're my my four staples in life with anybody who crosses my path right like you got one chance (laughs) yeah that's it one good you get one chance to make a first impression and it it doesn't matter if you're black uh, hispanic chinese white anything you're getting the same level from me as you'll get from anybody else right, exactly yeah absolutely i mean like i even looked at the post that i shared and i, I shared with my dad and like everybody loves my dad and somebody commented on the post that was like i've never actually met your dad but i've been in a hockey arena and as soon as he walked into the arena everybody in the arena was just like hey raj how's it going raj and she was just like seeing that joy that he brought to the hockey arena brought me joy. And I was like, that's amazing because, you know, you don't even know somebody, but you, you see that. And so that was pretty cool. <laughs> you can't walk through Nottingham without hearing different dialects and accents and mm-hmm. everything. Nottingham is a very, very diverse city. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a great start, like diversity right there. <laughs> so yeah, it's just about harnessing that, right? Yeah. It's, it's harnessing it, embracing those communities, bringing yeah. them in and, it's just hockey in the UK is a very small community, but it's a very, the, the big slogan across the elite league has always been hockey is for everyone. It's mm-hmm. uh, the, the elite league has always been a very inclusive environment from what and my, I've been a fan of it for 10 years, worked in it for three now. And I, I've always found it to be, I've never known any problems with, with LGBT communities, with racialness in there. I'm sure as kids are growing up through the system, it happens, but you don't find out about it. Sort of thing. And that's what's now coming to light because right. of all of this stuff. Right. Because I, I totally believe that we need to put policies and practices in place that are going to stop it. Because for so long, like when you're growing up playing, it's like, just beat them on the ice. Like, don't say anything. Don't let it get to you. Just beat them on the ice. Well, that's wrong because we need to show people that if you make a comment, you shouldn't be making that comment. So definitely putting policies in, in place to prevent that. So we can kind of nip that in the bud when kids are small. Definitely, because th- that kind of behavior is learned. It is not, as everyone says, it's not born right. into someone. Everything right. is learned. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Th- 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 there's no good segue out of that into a, a fun. Yeah. Topic. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just I'm going to flip the script a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to, th- that's my way of doing it. It's just the humor. That's the, it's going to catch everyone off guard. I'm just going to flip it just yeah. like that. So <laughs> I, I can't thank you enough for giving up your time for this. This has yeah, been, awesome. this has been incredible. But I want to know what, there's two, stories i want to hear Mm -hmm. your favorite hockey story of all time Mm -hmm. and your funniest hockey story of all time Mm -hmm. oh boy i've had a lot of like equipment mishaps so i mean like i've had blades fall out of the holder and like have to like crawl off the ice when i was young like i had to wear glasses and somebody like came up to me and like threw ice at my glasses so i had to play the last minute of the game like with ice on my glasses wow. <laughs> <laughs> right like little it was one of my teammates too like before a face off like there's probably like a minute left in the game she throws ice in my like cage trying to be funny and i couldn't see so that went over really well um but i think off of the ice like we actually one time with my junior team we'd gone out for dinner and the night before like I was one of the captains and we ended up ordering like a bunch of desserts and our coach was just ticked, like was so mad. And so the next day at the next restaurant we went for dinner, um, I like wanted to play a prank on her. So I like called the server over and I was like, it's our head coach's birthday. Like, is there anything you guys do? Like, do you guys bring out like little cakes or whatever? And he was like, yeah, yeah, we're at this Mexican restaurant. And so great food, great desserts. And it was this place where like they get everybody else in the restaurant, like not just your table 
everybody in the restaurant's like saying happy birthday all the employees come out and so he like is walking over with his cake and my coach sees and like she just like narrows her eyes at me like knowing that this is me and he comes plops this big thing in front of her and the whole place erupts in happy birthday and she was so embarrassed and so mad and I was like sorry <laughs> now you get a cake to enjoy <laughs> but I don't know we've had a ton of like crazy stories I'm like I have so many fun stories, like fun hockey stories, like growing up being in cars with my dad, going places, um, obviously going to like the Olympics and playing in the three on three. Like we had so much fun there. Um, I remember we walked the red carpet at the three on three and I actually had like, we actually wore these um, Beyonce um, Adidas collaboration okay. outfits. Okay. And so we were the only people in Canada that had got them. And so they let let us wear it on the red carpet and I had like a tailor in my room five minutes before I was walking down the red carpet like I couldn't like sit down on my pants I could only walk in my pants <laughs> and I don't know we just we just have so much fun like it's I have so many stories of just being off of the ice you know there are obviously the championships you win and what you do on the ice and practicing with your teammates but it's off the ice where you really make all of those memories so yeah <laughs> And just as a quick one, you mentioned wearing face cages. Then, do you ever foresee a future where female players don't wear face cages? Because seeing people's faces is important. It's very important. Um, that's something like an idea that a bunch of us have kind of thrown around a little bit. Obviously, not in a serious sense, but I don't know. I mean, for us now, it would be very hard for us to transition to not wearing a face cage, just because like we've grown up with it um the way that we play like sticks honestly come up all the time and hit you in your cage but you don't think about it because it's hitting your cage and bouncing off whereas that you got no cage <laughs> that's hitting you in the face so i'm not sure if that'll if that'll ever happen but you know stranger things have happened maybe one day but i don't think in my time <laughs> I just always been a curious thing because, like, you see it in like, and, and the WNBA is a huge example for the women's game. Like, yeah. you see, you see them about they're in the court on in a vest and shorts, and they're out there. They've got all these crazy hairstyles. There's mm -hmm. also they, they they're showing their personality. But when you're right. confined to a helmet, a cage, and all this big hockey equipment, you yeah. got you've got to find a way to express yourself rather than yeah. That's the hard thing about hockey players is like we can't express our personality for everybody to see it all the time. Like even when we um go to games like everybody's like in a suit or dress clothes and like there's no personality in that really either and so that's a big hockey player criticism I think and so yeah it's just finding ways to being able to express that personality and it's been frowned upon for so long because it's always been about don't stand out don't stand out part of the team but now the, the society is yes you can stand out you can still be yourself and be part of the team right yeah because I think hockey is like one of the most like team oriented sports like regardless of like you look at football or you look at basketball like those are guys can take over teams themselves like you look at LeBron James like he could go to any team and bring them to the NBA finals whereas in hockey like you can't do that you can't place Sidney Crosby on any team and they're automatically going to the NBA or at the NHL finals sorry like hockey is that team sport and so you're always bred to you know thank your teammates, be with your teammates, you know, be a part of that collective unit. And I think that's what's really brought us there. And one of the examples of that is a team I'm sure you watch closely is Edmonton. They got Connor McDavid. And yeah. <laughs> doesn't exactly. Yeah. Like, and he's so good. Like, it's crazy, crazy how good he is. But even Edmonton, like they've had like five top 10 or five number one picks in like the last 10 years and they still haven't won anything unfortunately <laughs> it's coming i'm sure it's coming i'm sure you'll be I there know. when when darnell yeah. lifts the cup there i'm sure you'll be yeah, around <laughs> yeah it has to be coming soon <laughs> yeah, well like i said before th thank you so so much for taking the time to do this this has been this has been an absolute pleasure yeah no problem thank you for having and, me and hopefully we've now got a new fan of the nottingham panthers in toronto yeah toronto, i'm gonna have canada. to get it i'm gonna have to make my way over there i've never actually been so i'm gonna have to make my way over there and get a jersey <laughs> you can come get a jersey if you come to a game you can drop the puck we'll put you on the big yes! jumbo tram we'll make the whole big splash about it and now you've said it on camera you have to come <laughs> i got accountability i'll be there i'll find my way over there <laughs> i will hold you to that <laughs> perfect <laughs>